So we're going to put a shoe on today, and we're going to bring the word. Yeah, I love being in a shoe. It's the first time in nine weeks I had a shoe on my foot. I put it on this morning. I walked around. My poor wife's going, you sure going to walk around in that? I said, yes, I am. <laughs> Tried it on first. And then I said, okay, okay, I think I like that. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 50. We're talking about towing the line of faith, towing the faith line. And Jesus, how he ministered to people, he always met them at where their faith was. And tried to always put a demand to bring their faith to a higher level. Somebody say higher level. Jesus always met people's faith. He always discerned by the Holy Ghost where their faith line was at. So that he could always identify. And everybody has a different faith approach. Everybody has a different faith line. Let's just put it that way. The measure of faith everybody has as believers. But we need to build that measure of faith. Somebody say build it. So when Jesus would meet somebody at their faith life, always by the discernment. So when we see the different stories in the Bible, how Jesus addresses people differently, we find out what's happening is the Holy Spirit is honed in on where they're at. But when God meets you at your faith level, it's always to raise your faith level. He's always going to meet you where you're at. He's going to elevate who you are. Because he always wants to move our faith higher. See, because, because even though he meets you at your today faith, he's already looking for your tomorrow faith. When he meets you at your today faith, he wants to challenge you and stretch that faith because he's looking at your tomorrow faith. Because when you walk in the faith of God and trust God to be God and the breakthrough that he is, then you'll find that every time you move forward, your faith goes higher and higher. Listen, God is pleased with your faith. Because the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. So we want to get ourselves into the platform of saying, God, let's get my faith in you. How I'm going to walk with you. How I'm going to trust you in my daily life. How I'm going to reach forward. Remember, it's not about maintaining your present status. God will meet you there. But he's going to stretch you to a higher level because he, he gets excited about doing this. So I want you to first turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15. And, and this one, I, I got fighting faith. Somebody say fighting faith. How many fighters do I have in the house? Okay. Fighting faith is a tenacious faith that makes a decision that you show up in my territory, it belongs to me. Okay. And the story in Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, shows how we've got this Canaanite woman up in Tyre in the upper regions that that could not connect with the ministry of Jesus because he was down in Galilee, he was down in Judea, and that's where he's ministering. But what happens is, is that he ventures up into her region, up into her world. And the Bible says, it says, and Jesus went out from there, departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. So he entered her territory. Now if you understand the story as a as pretty much as a Canaanite or, 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 or like a Gentile or Samaritan, they could not engage at this level with the miracles of the ministry of Jesus. It could only happen when Jesus stepped into their world because he was preparing his people to eventually invade those areas. But if Jesus invaded that area, then that gave them legal right to pursue him for his miracles. Let me say hallelujah. When Jesus is an anointing, invades your world, you have every right to put a demand on that anointing for your life. And here's what happens is that she shows up, and behold, this woman of Cana finds out Jesus is in the region. Say, he's in the region. Now understand, she's got to understand the miracle power of God, the anointing of God, the flow of God, the call of God, all the things that are moving in him. And here is this woman. She's got a desperate situation in her life. So she's going to have this demanding, fighting faith. And you don't think the Holy Spirit knows that she's there. And how do we know? Because it's in the book. This was something that God wanted to hone in on. So Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, ends up in this area. And this Canaanite woman comes charged and out, finds out Jesus is in her territory. He's in her area now. And because he is there, he has, she has every right to chase him down. And she ain't going to let go because she's got this fighting, tenacious faith. Because it's like, it's all him, it's in him. You're in my house, or you're in my territory. I have the right to come after you. That's exactly what she does. The whole the woman came and she starts crying out, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. And she just starts, my daughter is severely demon possessed. Everything's falling apart in my house. So she doesn't have time to stand around and just say, here's what's going on. She just starts shouting it out. She come at him. She come at him. <laughs> Somebody say come at him. She come at him. She come at him with the whole attitude of, this is my need. 
son of David. She starts calling out on him, starts calling out who he is. She identifies who he is and says, Lord, my daughter is severely demon-possessed, and she's going to stand there. Now, all the disciples, because Jesus doesn't answer her right away, disciples say, send her away. Why? Because, I'm coming down, by the Holy Spirit, Jesus already has located this woman's faith. He's already located it. And not like a cat and a mouse, but he's excited because now that he's located her faith, he's going to pull her faith a little bit farther, and he's going to show the episode, he's going to show the disciples how he's going to pull this woman. See, they don't discern it. He discerns it. He's got locked in on where her faith level is. Instead of just Letting that go, he's going to meet her at that faith, but he's going to pull her to another level. Somebody say, pull me. Pull me to another level. So here's what he does. Jesus kind of ignores her for a minute, and that's okay, because he's put the demand on her fighting faith, because he understands she's going to be tenacious and led by the Holy Spirit. He just lets her go for a minute, and she don't give up, does she? No, she doesn't. She comes right back at him. And she's chasing them down, and everybody's going, send her away. And Jesus said, look, he's kind of, he kind of throws it out at her. I know I wasn't sent but for anyone but for, the, but, you know, but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is who I've been sent for. I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He sent it out to her. And some people would take their ball and bat and go home at that point. Yeah, you're right. I don't deserve it. You're right. Does she do that? No. Because, see, he's in her territory. He's where she's at. And she's like, well, that may be nice, but I'm going to tell you what's really going on here. See, that's the attitude that Jesus was pulling on her. See, we get easily offended when we think it's not going to happen for us. And here, Jesus just puts a pressure on her. See, we don't like to be tested. We don't like to be challenged. Unless, of course, listen, did anybody here ever play sports? Okay, if you played sports, they just let you get by with just how you felt when it came to practice. They never did. They always pushed you harder and harder so you could find where you really could go. You are here, but you always get that one person pushing and putting a demand on you. Then you find out that really you can go here. And when you get to this point, you feel so much better about yourself because you realize you're better than what you thought. You can reach higher than what you thought. Because somebody pulled and pushed you and put a prod on you and you found yourself at a higher level and that makes you much greater content with who you are as a believer because it's like, or, as, or, or as a sports person, now you can be more effective. How about as a believer, the Holy Spirit is doing the same thing. It's why like we can't get offended when the Lord kind of puts a demand on our faith to pull us to a higher position. And so he just kind of throws this out. I wasn't sent to you. Kind of over his shoulder. and Kind of stands there like, go ahead and respond. I want to hear your response. He's, ha he's having fun because this woman's faith is about to go through the roof. He's about to teach his disciples a lesson. She's like, yeah, but you're in my territory. That's why she says, yeah, but even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. So you're in my territory. There's got to be some crumbs. Here I stand. I'm not letting go until I get something from you. Now, the Bible says that when we ask, seek, and knock, sometimes there's a word to put in demand, but demand is not an arrogance. The demand is in confidence on who God is. See, Jesus is putting a demand because of her need. She knows the healing anointing is on Jesus. And she knows that there's more than enough because if they don't want it, you're in my territory. Why don't you drop a few crumbs in my direction? And Jesus is just excited about her faith. And see, we got to look at this. And instead of getting offended, we have to say, God, I thank you. Pull my faith. I mean, we don't like to have God pull our faith, do we? But if you want to be effective in the future, you got to let God put a demand on your faith in the present. And remember, Jesus is putting a demand on your faith now for the purpose of your future effectiveness. He's going to pull you. And he's being gentle because he knows exactly, listen, she, he can't deal with the next person the same way. But he can deal with her this way. Because that's exactly where she's at. And Jesus just responds and says, oh, woman, I bet he was laughing. Your faith is awesome. Your faith is awesome. I love your faith. She's standing there with the attitude. You're in my territory. I ain't leaving. I'm going to badger you till I get what I need. Somebody say need. My daughter is demon possessed. You're in my territory. And here's what I need from you, Lord. Here's what I need. I need a word from you. Think about this. She's not even asking him to come to her house 
and lay hands on her demon-possessed daughter, what she wants from him is the crumb. You release here. The same thing almost as a centurion. You release a word, and I'm taking that word home with me. Somebody say hallelujah. See, what it is, is, is Jesus got her to the place of all she needs is the crumb. Just give me the word, and I know what's going to be done. And sometimes we, we think the anointing is only in the house, but when God gives the word, the goal is to take the word home with you and apply the word to the broken area, to the needing area, to the hurting area, to the diseased area. He gives you the word. Take the word to the problem and apply it. So all she needs is a word. He says, woman, your faith, is, your faith is awesome. It's done for you. Somebody say done. done. Well, you get the Holy Spirit check inside of you, and he puts that word inside of you. Then you know of a fact that God put a word, just a word. He put his word, his scripture, something down inside of you. Why? Because he wants you to use it, and he wants you to apply it. Sometimes we just want to hear God tell, well, it's all done, I got it. No. Sometimes what the Holy Spirit's going to do is put a word of his word down inside of you. The, the very prophetic of God, he's going to drop that word down inside of you, and you're going to make the decision that I'm going to take that word and I'm going to apply it. And, and we all know what happened, that because from that very hour, her daughter, Daughter was healed, and by the time she got home, her daughter was no longer demon possessed. But this little girl had been totally set free because mama would not let Jesus leave the territory until she got a, it's okay from him. Let me say hallelujah. Come on, people. We got to stay the course. Okay? We got to toe the line with the faith that we possess and let the Holy Spirit grab a hold of where we're at. And what happened here? Jesus pulled her to a higher level, put a greater demand on somebody who already was putting a demand, and he pulled her demand to a little bit higher, and then he satisfied her need because now her faith was greater. Remember, she's putting a demand on him, but then when she got her miracle, she moved to the next place. Now, let's go to the next one. And once you go to, once you go to Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, and this is going to be faith controlled by fear. So this is not a good one. <laughs> Somebody say not a good one. <laughs> not a good one. Mark's Gospel, chapter 4. This is, this is going to be faith controlled by fear. Mark 4, 35. And these are guys, these are the, these are the apostles, or these are the disciples. And they've been watching the ministry of Jesus. And in the ministry of Jesus, the Lord says, here's what we're going to do. He said, we are going to cross over to the other side. Now, always understand, here's something that's vital. If Jesus says, I want you to minister to that, I want you to pray for that, I want you to go there, there's one thing he's always going to do, and that is he's going to get into the boat with you. He never sends you, because Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel at the very end, I will, I will, I'm with you always. So when the Holy Spirit sends you somewhere, notice he didn't stay here. He goes where he's sending you. He's right alone because the ministry is him. It's his, his revelation of Jesus. So the goal is that when Jesus says to the guys, we're going over to the other side, he got in the boat with them. Somebody say amen. Now, their faith may have been high, but the problem is sometimes there's a connection with what is our revelation of Jesus and how can we handle a sudden opposition? Now, they're in the boat, as you know. Jesus is asleep. They got everything under control. And suddenly, somebody say suddenly. You know, the devil doesn't always just kind of come at you gradually. Sometimes he comes at you full bore, frontal assault, and you are caught off guard. Somebody say off guard. These guys were caught off guard. The storm suddenly rages up all over the place, and they begin to try in the natural to handle the problem. And what's happening now is they're beginning to fall into fear. Because they've lost sight of the very things that they've been watching Jesus do. They've stepped aside of who he is. They're not even sure of how strong he can be. And they're trying to level themselves against this storm. And they've got themselves so worked up, so panicked, so freaked out, so fearful. That they have no ability to use their faith because fear has taken dominion in the midst of the situation. And they don't know what to do except they go running to Jesus. But their but but run to Jesus is not in faith. Their run to Jesus is in fear. Because they don't think he's got what it takes to deliver them from what he set them into. Jesus, you brought me into this thing. Now I'm going to die. Jesus, you led me into this place. Now it's all going to be, I mean, Lord, you brought me here, and now it's all over. It's like, wait a minute. Who do you trust? I'm in the boat. 
Storms are going to come and they're going to catch you off guard. The biggest problem was they let fear on the inside suddenly confront everything and they could not react anything in the spirit because fear had too much power. And Jesus now has to stand up in the boat and he has to rebuke the storm instantly. Now because God's a merciful God. Say merciful God. Now here's the reason for God to be merciful here. is because they were where God wanted them to be. So Jesus was in their boat. You head off somewhere where God has not called you and not placed you. Then you got to find him, hunt him down, chase him down to dig you out of a problem. But if he sends you into something, understand, believers, we sometimes think, people have been kind of trained up thinking that now that I'm a Christian, everything's going to be perfect. Well, that's a lie. And then there was Walgreens. I mean, you know, the old commercial. Okay, that ain't true. You are an enemy to the adversary. And he's got to do an assault on you to try to push you down. But remember, all things do what? Work together for good. To them that what? Love the Lord. And number two, are the called according to his purpose. Are you walking in the purpose of God? Are you walking in the general realm of God? Are you pursuing his heart and his will? Are you at least doing the basic things that the word of God, even if you don't have the great calling on you yet, are you walking according to the word of God? Are you walking in in grace? Are you walking in the love of God? Are you attempting to be where God wants? See, as long as you're in the place, God's always in your boat. Even when you get out of the boat, he's always right there to chase you down. But he's in the boat. And when this storm explodes and blows up inside these people's faces, they totally let go of who he is. It's called panic. And in a panic, they forget who he is. They step completely away from the supernatural. They've been, they've been walking into things of God. They forget it all. Fear takes dominion. They're trying to bail their way out. They're going to die. God, don't you care? But they still cried out to him. And in his mercy, and in a teaching moment, to meet them with their faithlessness, he addresses them, and he also addresses the reason for their faithlessness. Notice in, verse, in this In verse 40, and he said to them, why are you so fearful? You let fear dominate you instead of you dominating fear. This is important, believers, because freaking out, fearing, stress, you name it, Everything comes in, and if we're not staying connected in the Holy Spirit and trusting that Jesus is our peace, these things can begin to overwhelm us and leave us in a place where we have no idea what to do. And we find ourselves just either yelling at God, begging at God, being mad at God. People do this all the time. They're always jumping over because of the conflict. They don't know what to do. God isn't big enough. He's not bringing it through. Come on, isn't that how we sometimes react to a, to a calamity. Not everybody jumps up and goes, I have faith to move the mountains. Storms be still. First, they're screaming bloody murder, yelling, hollering. Everything is falling apart. And then finally, when God digs them out because he's merciful, they want to move on. But what the Holy Spirit needs to do is grab a hold of them and say, now, let's talk about the problem you had. You let yourself be controlled by fear. Now, that's a discipline, that's a rebuke, that's an exhortation from the Holy Spirit. He says, why are you so fearful? Why is it that you have very little faith in my ability? That's what he said about so little faith. It wasn't that. Jesus would say, we all should just jumped up and rebuke the storm, which we're all learning how to do that. But he says, you could have addressed me by faith. Lord, we don't know what to do. Show us. Did you ever ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, show me. Before you charge in headlong and freak out, here, Jesus basically said, if you had faith in my capability, somebody said capability. You see, faith comes by what? And hearing comes by what? Now, both those words are active words. It's not that I heard just one scripture. It's by a constant hearing of the word of God. Constantly hearing and receiving. The seed of God's word has to go into what? The good ground. It's got to be allowed to germinate. It's got to be allowed to grow. It's got to be allowed to expand so that it can be faithful. When we're hearing the word of God, we got to be ongoing. Let me say ongoing. Ongoingly hearing the word of God. So we get the revelation of the word of God, because sometimes all we need from God is how to address the matter. 
We've talked about strategy across the last couple of weeks. David had faith in God completely. Just give me the strategy and how you're going to confront this, and I'll trust you all the way. All we need from God is a strategy. So they could awaken Jesus, and say, excuse me, Lord, it's the storms whirling all over the place. We're having a little bit of a problem here, and we know, Jesus, we know you have the answer. Twelve guys standing there like this going, Lord, I know you got the answer. So tell us what we need to do. I mean, total confidence. You know, they're ready to break out, you know, the communion. I'm kidding, they didn't have communion at that point. But, but they're just ready to, okay, you just tell us what to do. You're in the boat. We're on our way. Tell us. We want, this is a learning lesson, Jesus. Everybody just sits down on their, on their little benches. Every the waves are clowning. Lord, this is a learning moment. All like little students with their teacher, tell us what to do. Well, did that happen? No. They were screaming and flopping and falling around and dying and hollering. I mean, it was horrible. Jesus kind of goes, he, I bet he had to say, shut up and shut up. <laughs> he had to meet them at their fear level. And then he rebukes them for not recognizing what is in him. If we're going to be effective for God, because God wants to lead you into the territories of devils, demons, and darkness. He's going to do it. But he doesn't want you, he doesn't want to lead you in there without you knowing who he is. And if you charge ahead into devils, demons, and darkness's territory, and you don't know how great your God is, the devil's going to have you for lunch. Because as soon as he throws a, thrun, a frontal assault, you're going to back away. We go in with understanding. Jesus was in the belt to teach these guys a lesson. So fear had the power in order to control their faith. And I want you to stay in Mark's gospel, go to chapter 5. And this is called pressing faith. But when we start this, I want you to look at verse 21. The story is not the woman with the issue of the blood, though she is a part of the story. The story is another dimension and the woman with the issue of the blood jumps in on the story because she wanted to have her name written in the Bible. I'm kidding. Uh, so did we have it? That was funny. She wanted to have her name written in the Bible. That's why she jumped in on the story. Okay. She had great discernment. Then in the future, you know, Matthew and Mark, these guys are going to write this story. So yeah, I want in on that story. Okay. Anyways. Jesus crosses over by, now this, in the pressing faith, I also have the second one. And that is, don't let go of your faith, but in this, it's meeting you at your limited faith. Because there's two kinds of faith here. One is going to be a pressing faith, and the first one is going to be a limited faith, but still faith. See, Jesus is going to meet each one at a different level. And as he goes over, verse 21, he crossed again over by boat to the other side. A great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea, verse 22. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue, this is important. This was the guy who had religiosity potentially written all over him. Because the synagogue, most of the rulers had nothing to do with Jesus. And half of them wanted him, you know, half of them wanted him put to death. But this man has enough sense to realize there's a problem. And it says, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jarius by name. And when he saw Jesus, he ran and fell at his feet. Now that is a desperate situation, but at least he fell at Jesus' feet. He went to Jesus to grab a hold of Jesus, and he begins to do what? What's the word here? Beg him. Please. Please, Jesus. So there's a limited faith here, but there is a faith here anyways. And he starts begging him and starts pleading with him. And here's the story. And he says, come. He says, my little girl lies at the point of death, and he's terrified of death itself. My little girl is afraid, is at the point of death, and I'm terrified she's going to die, which is what he's saying. Therefore, please, please come and lay your hands on her so that she may be healed, so that then she will live and not die. Now, he's in the desperation, but he's also in a limited, because, her attitude, because his attitude seems to be, if she dies, it's over with. But I know that if you come and you lay your hands on her, because I know you can do that, that you can drive the disease off her. So if you drive the disease off her, she shall be healed. And therefore, I know that she will live. So let's confront this thing before it even gets to the point where she even dies. So please, Lord, come and lay your hands on her. That's, that's, that's good faith, right? But that is a limited faith. But it's faith that says, as long as we get things before this point, then we can have the breakthrough. As long as we get God involved at this point, then we can have the breakthrough. Once we go beyond this point, 
then it's out of God's hands and it's all over with. So he's trying to get Jesus to the point before it goes too far because that's as far as his faith can go, which is the place where most of our faith tends to reside. If we can get Jesus to respond in the, in the sphere of where we locate ourselves, then we know we can probably have the miracle. And notice I, I emphasize the word probably. But once we get beyond a certain point, that's when people are willing to back up, back off, because they have just found the limitation of their faith. The story that comes up, or, but we need the desperate faith of the woman who was willing to have that fighting faith. But here we've got in the middle of this. So now Jesus says, fine, I'm going to go and I'm going to lay hands on your little girl. But something shows up live, comes right in the middle, and another desperate need shows up. And you understand the Holy Spirit is well aware of what's taking place. Listen, Jesus said, I don't do anything but what I see my father do. So being fully led, he's on this adventure in, an, in part of watching the presence of God, the power of God in his life, lead, govern, guide, and operate. So he's not going to stop. He's not going to get desperate. He knows that he's going to come and lay hands on this little girl's life. But in the meantime, somebody else is, is, is using what I call pressing faith. In the middle of it, one thing doesn't stop because of another. God is always healing and ministering. While you need your miracle on the way to your miracle, somebody else should have the right to get their miracle. And because Jesus steps in and handles somebody else's miracle, doesn't mean he doesn't want to follow through with your miracle. People that, you know, we can get very covetous over the miracle of God. God, I got to have that miracle. How can you, Jesus, now you're taking care of this one? What about my life? What about me in this miracle? Well, what happens is, is as he's pressing through the crowd to go to this man's house, now, this is the man, his, the man's wife is also back at the home, probably with the little girl who's dying. She's about 12 years of age. As Jesus is, is going through, this woman comes pressing through the crowd and shuts everything down and grabs a hold of the hem of his garment and instantly Jesus, listen, Jesus is never, you know, he's never aware, unaware of what's going on. And the moment this woman touches his garment, he recognizes another dimension of faith. I mean, he was hungry to see people's faith. He loved people's faith level. He loved to stir people's faith level. Sometimes he got aggravated at people's faith level. But everything about your breakthrough and the purpose as a believer to be effective in your assignment is where your faith level is at. Because the devil is always going to try to get you to give it up. And Jesus knows that everything comes from faith to faith. And the gospel is from faith to faith. From beginning all the way to the end. You have to trust God, believe God, walk with God. Your faith is going to have to be the number one thing operating in your life as a believer. That's why we need the word of God in order to produce that faith. And then the wisdom of God, how to act on that faith. And the tenacity in ourselves in order to walk that thing out. Somebody say amen. Now we got to make a decision. So here, Jesus is on his way, and another kind of faith reaches up, and while he's pushing and walking, and the crowds are all around, suddenly he feels glory just shoot through his being. Somebody just touched me with a miracle-pulling faith. Somebody operated a pressing faith, and Jesus knows automatically, do not let this faith go. We need to challenge this faith. We need to secure the faith that just touched me. Listen, he's, not, Jesus, you know, he's interested in the future of your faith. And just a touch is not enough for him. He's excited. So since he got somebody who was hungry enough to touch him by faith, that is a teaching, equipping moment. Jesus doesn't want you just to get by. You give him a little bit of faith for him to see the miracle in your life, and he wants to stop and train you and teach you and equip you. He wants to disciple. Anybody who's hungry for God, God wants to disciple you. And disciple is always to bring you to the higher level from where you already are in the first place. And here this woman touches the hem of the garment. Fire flows from Jesus into this woman. And he stops the whole crowd. Can you imagine the dad? We got to get there before my little girl dies. You've got to drive the disease out of her body so that she can live. If you do not confront this disease, my little girl is going to die. So he's pushing, he's shoving, probably trying to lead the line, and Jesus stops to deal with somebody else's faith because somebody touched him in a way that was very great, and yet in their great touch, they're, they're operating very innocent in their touch. And Jesus knew, it, you know, knew immediately that he needed to impart something to strengthen somebody else's faith. So the Bible says he's looking around. Now, it doesn't say whether or not he knew that it was a woman or who, what it was, but he put a demand 
I'm this person to come forward. He says, who touched me? He didn't let her get away. He kept looking around. So the woman received her healing and was probably paralyzed in the breakthrough. My gosh, I've been healed. And here, and she was hoping she could just step back out of the crowd and got her touch because she had this wonderful, marvelous little faith. But her faith could have been distorted in the future if she thought it was only connected to touching the hem of his garment. She needed to know that it was the faith that was in her, in him, that pulled the anointing from his garment. So Jesus puts a demand, and he says, who touched me? And his, you know, and his disciples being, you know, being the total group of faith guys that they weren't. Lord, everybody's crowding you. People are pushing on you. you know, sometimes they threw the sick in front of you. I mean, how do you, I mean, somebody touched you? Yes, somebody touched me with faith. The rest of these people are just crowding, but somebody in the house, they have a house full of people, shoulder to shoulder, line to line, but, but dispersed all the way through there. Are going to be people who have garment-touching faith. And that's who Jesus is going after. It could be packed full of people calling themselves Christian, and 80% of them may never have the kind of faith to ever reach up and touch the garment. Jesus is not trying to entertain the 80%. He's looking for those that have garment-touching faith. Somebody willing to press it and pursue so he can strengthen that faith. He never let the Pharisees shut him down because he was always standing in the presence of somebody whose faith needed to be strengthened and fed. There was eternity here. You chose yours, but here, right here, I came for this level of faith to touch it again. And Jesus just says, where are you? Where are you? Here she comes all trembling like I did something wrong. Uh -uh. And she tells him everything that she did. I'm sick. I got this disease and I've been bleeding for years. And I felt that if I just snuck through and touched the hem of your garment, that I could, I could suck some of that anointing off of you. And Jesus has to challenge her and says, woman, that's not what it was. Verse 34. It was your faith in my ability that made you whole. And he suddenly shapes her faith. Woman, it wasn't the touching of the garment. It was you. I mean, think about bolstering this woman's confidence. You did it. You pulled it from my garment. You pulled it from me. You pulled it out of me. It is right here for the touch. But you touched it by faith. You pulled the Think about all the glory, all the deliverance, all the healing that flows in and on and through the master. And how few people actually go to press it and touch it to draw from it. Because we don't have a physical garment, but we have it in the heavenly realms. We have it in the spirit. We got the word of God right here with us. At any point, we can just put our hands on that word and let that glory transform our life. All this is available, and people will never lift their hands and try to touch the master. Jesus loved her simplicity and approach. He just strengthened and said, woman, it's because you believe, therefore you pulled it from me. I'm here for you. And he blesses her. Go and be whole. Your faith has made you well. People get the wrong mindset about faith. I just got to have faith to have faith. No, your faith has got to be in something. Faith comes by here. You cannot have faith. You have presumption. Until you actually have the word of God in you to produce the faith. She had the faith in her. She knew that she knew that she knew that she knew that if she touched that. It wasn't like trying to get somewhere. All she, she knew, if I just touched it, that's it. It's done. And I have my miracle. And then to find out it wasn't in the garment, it was in her. There are strength in every believer's faith. Are you willing to go before the throne of God with confidence? Can you touch glory with the touch of faith? And get ourselves to the place, come on, can we as believers get ourselves to the place where we're really wanting to say, Jesus, I want to know the strength of my faith. Listen, we don't like that so often, but only those that have that tenacious, only those that have fighting faith are going to reach them and say, I want to strengthen my faith. The disciple says, Lord, strengthen our faith. Fine, I'm going to tell you how to speak to that mountain or to that mulberry bush. You tell it to go here and do there, it'll do it. Huh? The faith of God in you is what you need. Now, Let's continue with this story as I close. 
When this happens, I want you to go over to Luke's Gospel, chapter 8. Because this is how, I like how the story ends. Because remember, as this whole ministry is taking place, about this woman pressing through, we still have the start of the whole story, which is the man, and then eventually his wife. And it said, verse 49, chapter 8 of Luke's Gospel. While he was still speaking, Someone came from the ruler's house. Your daughter is dead. It's over with. And why trouble the master any further? You missed the point. You missed the time. You missed it. Can you imagine in his heart instantly? We hadn't stopped for this woman. My daughter would be, he doesn't say it. My daughter would be alive. They just came in and they released the word. It's gone beyond the line that we've drawn for you. It's gone beyond the line where you thought that your faith could only go. And it's over with. It's done. God can't go any farther. He can't do any more for you. This is as far as it's going to be. You are going to die because the doctor said. It's never going to happen because somebody else said. You believed God, but when you got to that point where you wanted it right there, it wasn't there at that point. And you begin to panic and freak out because that's as far as your faith could go. Now, Jesus meets him. What did I say? He meets you at your faith. He met that woman at her faith. And pulled it up. He met the disciples when they let fear control them. And he met them and he bolstered their faith that they could see how much greater he is than what they thought. He met this, they met this fighting faith, fighting woman and pulled her to the place where she made the kind of confession he needed her to make. And he doesn't turn and lambast these guys or lambast this man or his wife. But Jesus heard it. And he immediately turns and he shuts that whole spirit down and he says what? Do not be afraid. He starts right there. Because what crept in? Just like any, every other time. The devil knows fear works every time. Why would he try something new? Because the old thing works. As long as the old works, why fix it? The devil knows if he can get you into fear, he can get you into failure. Get you into fear, he'll get you into failure. And what happens is, it says, he says, do not be afraid. Only believe, notice what he says, hold the line with your faith. Hold the line. Hold your faith. Your faith, he says, do not, he says, do not be afraid. Only believe and she will be made well. Only believe. He puts a demand on him. Come on, stay with me here. Stay with me. The Holy Spirit's saying, stay with me. Stay the line. Stay the line. It ain't done yet. I'm about to pull your faith to another level. This is where you drew the line. Uh-uh. Jesus does not lie. He tells that guy, he says, uh-uh. Do not fear. Let's put that under. Stay right with me. I've got you. I'm in your world. I'm right alongside you. He's being gentle with this man's faith. He didn't have to you know, be aggressive like he was with the disciples, but he's very gentle but very strong. Hold the line and your little girl will be made well. That is a challenge as believers. The man could have said, it's over with. It's all done. Turned and walked away. See, when we get ourselves into a, into a place where we don't think go any farther, and God's trying to convict us that we can go farther, we get ourselves offended and turn and walk away because we don't want to go farther. We don't know how to go farther. But Jesus knew how to go farther. He knew by the Spirit of God, this, whether he knew the, world, the little girl was going to die, he took care of life because he already knew that she was going to live. He got that from the very beginning. I'm going to go lay hands on her. It doesn't matter. Because Jesus, because, listen, God's faith is not limited. It's only ours. So he puts a demand on them because he needs them to stay with him. Somebody say, stay with Jesus. We got to stay right with him. Yeah, but I don't understand. We're freaking out. I don't understand. And that's why people step back and they wonder why they can't get their miracle. And this is vital for, for believers. You want God to be so full of his mercy and everything else and just do it and totally despite myself. He's like, you know, I'd rather do it through you. 
And when you step back and go back into fearless or fearfulness and faithlessness, how can God go any farther with you? Remember, the man could have stepped back into the crowd and everything would have stopped right there. He'd have buried his little girl within 24 hours. That's exactly what would have happened because that was the time frame in the Jewish community. But Jesus says, uh uh, fear not, only believe, and your little girl shall be made well. And he addresses this. He walks in and he confronts the spirit of death by not giving it one ounce of power. So you can give a sickness power, you can give a disease power, you can give a circumstance tremendous power, we can give death power, yeah, we can give a doctor statement power. We can, no, I'm not going to give those things power. Somebody say, no power. No power to the enemy. If you embrace the enemy's thoughts, then he's got power. You've embraced what he says. And we want to defeat the enemy's power. And his power is in his lie. Because he wants to get us to embrace his lie so we let go of faith. So when Jesus walks up, the man is still terrified of death. And notice Jesus has not even used the word. He says, only believe and she will be made well. He didn't say, I'm going to raise her from the dead. Because that's not where the man's faith was. He said, she's going to be well. She'll be, she'll be fine. She's fine. Hey, but I, I told you she's not. She'll be fine. So when they were all in there meeting him with all the screamers and the criers and the shouters and the hollerers, he says, shut up. She's not dead. She's only sleeping. He would not give death an ounce of power because he knew what he could do. Now stand your feet in the house. God always wants to keep us on the front line, toe the line of our faith, but he's right with us. He never wants to give the enemy an ounce of authority anywhere. And he wants us to stick alongside with him. Our natural circumstances and our problems in life tend to want to dictate how we're going to respond. We can whine, or whine and cry about everything the devil has done in our life. And how horrible it all is and entertain everything that's bad. But there comes a point in time when we got to grab a hold of the Lord and say, now, Lord, walk alongside me because I want to move all the way through. Jesus told them, do not fear. Only believe. She'll be made well. Why? Because the interruption to moving towards your house is all still connected to the plan of God because I'm going to stretch your faith. I'm going to stretch your faith in the most powerful way. You can actually see death has no power. But in this case, He's going to gently walk right alongside this man. And the whole way through, he's going to rebuke any other lie from hell. She's not dead. She's always clear. Jesus just held that man. That man probably was, his faith was right at that shaking edge. It's not going to be good. But Jesus just, stay, stay with me here. Stay with me here. Stay with me here. Don't step back. Stay with me here. I told you in my word. I release a word to you. Now you hang on to that word. I give you a word. God releases the word into your spirit. And circumstances are screaming. Circumstances are yelling. It's dead. It's over with. It's done. You can't go any farther. No. God's word does not lie. He's proving us the miracle power of himself. So that it's written in the book. So we have something to draw from that. Even when it seems impossible, Jesus still said, no, it's not done. She will live. She'll be well. It's okay. Death, you're alive. She's just sleeping. It is not done yet. I got this thing. Just stay with me all the way. He got rid of all the weepers. He didn't let them have power. All the naysayers, all the doubters, all the so-called Christians that want you to step back from your faith walk because they have none. And that's the truth. Some of you right now know exactly what I'm saying. Oh, they're all so pious and they're so spiritual they go to church, but your calamity is, oh, I've seen that before. You are going to die but, you know, we're going to pray that God be merciful to your life and he'll bless you. You get out of my face. That's religiosity. That's death. All piousness in church is nothing but religion. Religion has no fire, has no faith, has no power. People dying all the time and no one doing anything about it because that's just the way it is. Get out of my face. So Jesus shoved it all away. Took three of his disciples, the top three, took the mother and the father, walked in there with the joy. Think about the victory of God on him. He didn't walk in there with, he did not listen. He did not entertain the spirit of the moment. 
walk in there all solemn, all broken. He walked, I don't know if he was cracking jokes, okay? He walked in there with joy. Why? Because he wasn't going to step back from what he knew to be the victory. He walked into that room. He walked in that house with all the glory of heaven on him. Walked in there with the mother and father. I told you it's going to be well. Never stepped back with. So that's what they had to hang on to. Jesus is confident. Think about it. You hang on to confidence, don't you? Somebody's confident, you want to hang on to that. God is confident. God is confident. He walks in that room, looks over, takes you by the hand and says, little girl, arise. And instantly, whoom, life shot back on her body. Her very soul from, the, from Abraham's bosom was just called instantly back. Disease was driven from her body, and she woke up and sat up. It was done. I told you she would be made well. Give her something to eat. She will have long life. Lift your hands up before the Lord in the house, would you please? These are all challenges at different levels, towing the line of faith and challenges. And we make decisions as believers. If we're going to engage life, we have to find, let God find us where we're at. And when he finds you, let him challenge you. It's not because he doesn't love you, but he wants to move through you. He wants to strengthen your faith so you run alongside. And you'll be able to see the kingdom of God advance. God's all about your increase. He's all about bringing his kingdom through your life. And in the hardest seasons, he's right there to show you how to confront them. Storms can be stopped. Death can be defeated. Deliverance can come. Healing can come. The miracle of God, all this that flows from the master. All he wants us to do is engage him. Let him show us. Give you the word. Stand alongside. Don't step back. Let him finish what his word said. Don't doubt his word. He's right there to walk it to its completion. He does not lie, church. His word is not a book of lies. It's a book of truth. And we have that so we can the same Holy Ghost that dwelt in him, dwells in the church. Our king is seated at the right hand of power. All the glory for your deliverance is on him. All he asks us to do is grab a hold of the word he gives us and don't let go. Stay right alongside him. He will loose you and set you free. The breakthrough is yours. Let me say hallelujah. The breakthrough is yours. It is yours. That's the word. Your breakthrough is yours. It is yours. It is yours. Somebody shout hallelujah. It is yours. Hallelujah. It is yours. Give him a shout of praise. 